a new book from an artificial intelligence pioneer. I'm Tanya Hall for ZDNet and Tech Republic, and joining me is Dr. Kai Fu Lee. He is the chairman and CEO of Sinovation Ventures and author of AI Superpowers. Welcome, Dr. Lee. Thank you. Thank you very much. You were a pioneer in technology, holding senior positions at Apple, Microsoft, Google, and others. Give us a brief summary of your resume. Uh, sure. I have my PhD in speech recognition in 1988. It was the first speech system that worked for speaker-independent speech recognition. Uh, then I worked for Apple, uh, Microsoft, SGI, uh, in, in the, um, uh, basically in the U.S., uh, running technology groups as a vice president. I started Microsoft Research in China, which is uh, one of the top research firms, uh, research uh, institutes in Asia today. And then I started Google China. And since 2009, I've left Google and Sunovation Ventures is a venture capital firm that I run. It's a top AI investment firm and we manage about $2 billion. You just published a book titled AI Superpowers, China, Silicon Valley, and the New World Order. Coming from the book, what was China's Sputnik moment? It was when AlphaGo defeated uh, Li Zedong uh, because Go was an ancient Chinese game and it shocked everyone that this Western uh, AI could beat uh, the best, one of the best players in the world. What happened in 2013 to create China's alternate internet universe? And what is the state of Chinese internet today? Well, uh, China actually started its internet industry back in the late 90s. Uh, but back then, it was all copycats. But through copycatting, uh, Chinese entrepreneurs have become uh, very, very powerful, strong, tenacious, and hardworking. And because of a huge market, so much capital flew in, came in uh, to help the Chinese entrepreneurs develop their own set of innovations. So over the past 15 or 20 years, uh, Chinese entrepreneurs have gone from copycat to innovators. And uh, copycat was the perfect practice they needed. Uh, but now those who continue to copy, of course, get nowhere as we would expect. But those who through copying learn the art of developing products for users, and then they, they benefited from a large market with a huge amount of data, which was perfect for AI. And therein developed the, is the secret recipe for the Chinese uh, internet companies and the Chinese um, uh, AI companies that benefited from a lot of data. They came up with new products for, uh, that were perfect for developing countries. And uh, they figured out how to make money and developed an entirely different business model than Silicon Valley. Rather than developing light tech companies, Chinese companies have developed very uh, heavy, hard to replicate companies. Companies built on uh, operational excellence and built on complicated software and human labor combined that makes it very difficult to copy. So as a result, some of the emerging Chinese companies, you know, DD is worth more than Uber, Meituan is worth 10 times more than uh, companies like Yelp or Groupon. Uh, it's because they've built uh, really stronger products uh, with a completely different business model and with AI powering it all. The US and China are fierce competitors in many domains. How does artificial intelligence compare between the two countries? Well, US is uh, well ahead in the research. Uh, universities in US are leaps and bounds better than the Chinese universities. But by and large, professors publish openly. So China has the implementation edge and the Chinese companies are able to find uh, ways to make money and, and they have a larger market to build from. And AI gets better with data. And uh, in the age of AI, data is the new oil and China is the new uh, Saudi Arabia. So with these advantages, Chinese implementation and monetization and valuation of the companies have um, already started to eclipse the U.S. and probably will have a larger lead uh, unless there is a big breakthrough in the U.S. which might change the whole equation again. The book contains interesting graphics called the risk of replacement graphs. Tell us about what AI can and actually can't do. Sure. Uh, AI is very good when trained on a large amount of data for a single domain. 
uh, to do better predictions and decisions. So jobs that are routine, such as customer service, uh, telemarketing, uh, dishwashing, uh, assembly line uh, will be displaced by AI over the next 15 years or so. And, and um, so one has to wonder with so many job displacements, uh, what should people aspire to and what are jobs that will become open uh, that AI cannot do? Certainly one possibility is jobs of creativity, uh, jobs requiring strategic thinking and conceptual thinking, but there aren't that many of such jobs. Uh, the other category that AI cannot do is jobs that have empathy and compassion. So essentially service jobs that have a large human-to-human -human interaction component. Uh, so jobs like uh, nurses and uh, nannies and tour guides, uh, jobs uh, like concierge, uh, bartender, masseuse. Uh, these are the jobs that can be growing in number, in particular jobs in education and healthcare. I think we don't nearly have enough workers there to deliver um, a one-to-one -one, um, comfort from a healthcare sense, elderly care sense. We don't have nearly enough workers as teachers to give more personalized education, which will become ever more important in the age of AI. So my thinking is that uh, just as we went through agricultural to manufacturing job transition in the past two centuries, we will now go through a routine job to empathetic job uh, transition in the next 20 years. How do differing attitudes towards privacy and government involvement in markets affect the progress of AI between the two countries? Uh, China's privacy rules are more at the, you cannot sell data of your user to another entity. So actually it's stronger than the US in the, like in the Facebook uh, Cambridge Analytica case. Um, but it's also true that Chinese uh, companies collect a lot more data uh, with user consent. Um, and also Chinese users use a lot more services digitally. For example, in China, uh, there's no, basically no credit cards and no cash anymore. So imagine, if you will, uh, the equivalent of Facebook and Amazon in China are the credit cards, are the Visa and MasterCard. So they've got a lot of data and they'll use that data uh, to provide a better product experience for the user and also to make money for themselves. Um, and the government is, um, takes a very techno-utilitarian approach, which means they'll let uh, software companies play credit cards and banks for a while until there's a proven need for regulation, then they'll step in. In the particular case of um, uh, digital money and mobile payments, uh, the two companies, Tencent and Alibaba, did such a great job the government just let them keep going, so much so that um, it's pretty much squeezed cash and credit cards out of usage and created tremendous convenience and removed the two to three percent charge that credit cards get. So China now has leapfrogged the U.S. in its legal in its mobile payment uh, to provide convenience for the users, leveraging data and getting more data and getting support from the government to uh, to try without a massive lobbying or issues that. That, are, that may have been raised by banks or credit card companies. So what should individuals do today to better position themselves for the implementation age of AI? Well, uh, for the professionals and creatives, uh, watch for tools and start to use them. Uh, just as um, journalists use Word and uh, photographers use Photoshop, I think every profession, doctors, lawyers, research analysts, financial planners will have AI tools. And for people in routine jobs, I think it's time to start thinking uh, that these jobs will disappear. And um, you'd be well advised to think about more empathetic jobs. Dr. Kai-Fu Lee, Chairman and CEO of Sinovation Ventures and author of AI Superpowers, which I highly recommend. It's a great read. If somebody wants to connect with you, Dr. Lee, how can they do that? Uh, there's a website, AISuperpowers.com, and I answer all the emails sent there. All right. Thanks again for your time. And if you want to find more of my interviews, you can do that right here on ZDNet or Tech Republic, or maybe go to my website, tanyahall.net. I've got links to all my social sites. Thanks for watching.